Hi, this is Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart, and today is Thursday, November 10th, 2016. Uh, in this video, I want to take a look and talk about um, the fixed income markets. Uh, most of what Right Side of the Chart is about is swing trading, which swing trading uh, is simply you know, identifying typically stocks. We'll swing trade anything, as you guys know, precious metals, commodities like corn, wheat, uh, even bond ETFs at, at times. And uh, but most of what we do are stocks and ETFs and um, swing trades. They can last anywhere from, well, anywhere from days. I've even we even have some that are closed out the same day they're entered if they're explosive price patterns. But typically, you're talking three weeks to maybe a couple months on an average swing trade position. Sometimes longer, five six months depending on the pattern. And um, but I also do uh, you know per both personally and on the site. Uh, investing, and I have a category called long-term trades. Those are trades expected to last six months or longer and produce above average returns. So those could be referred to as trend trades or trying to catch the bulk of a trend or something that just looks good to kind of tuck away for a while. And, you know, I wear, personally, I wear both hats uh, as, a, as a trader, swing trader and investor. I'll even day trade from time to time when the opportunity is there. But my two main trading styles are, you know, longer term investing. You know, I'm in my 40s as is my wife. So we have money, you know, we're still working and plan to work for, you know, for the foreseeable future. Let's put it that way for quite some time. I enjoy what I do and I can hopefully do this into my golden years. And um, so therefore, you know, I have retirement accounts and I uh, have two two young children. So I have college funds for the for them. And, um, it, those are, those are where I invest and I'm doing this video because I know a lot of you, I have to imagine, uh, you know, even if you are an active trader, you also have longer term accounts and you invest as well. So this, the importance here, even though, um, you might not have money in bonds or might not, uh, maybe you, had, you do have money in bonds. The importance here, I want to go over the bond market and some potential developments, things that I'm seeing most recently, as well as some long-term developments, because the bond market is important. And, and the financial markets, most importantly, are intertwined. Uh, stocks and bonds historically have, have pretty much had an inverse correlation. You know, I don't know if you know my background. I was, you know, a business major, and after graduating from, you know, college, I, I rolled right into a career as a stockbroker. So, you know, rule number 101 in investing is diversify among different asset classes, stocks and bonds being the two largest, and then you have commodities, real estate, some other niche investments that you can round out a portfolio with. But uh, so for investing, that's that's what we look at, and. Um, uh, some of you may know this, some might not. The bond market is much larger than the stock market. Uh, you know, I've, as of last year, I was reading an article recently, which I might quote throughout this, in the journal, and it, it, it mentioned at the time the bond market was over one and a half times larger than the stock market. Um, so very, a very important market. That's where a lot of institutional investors, uh, institutions have their money, pension plans. Uh, people have 401k money in there. And of course, individual investors, particularly those uh, closer to retirement that need more steady income or less risk adverse investors. You know, in other words, you know, the old golden rule in investing, it was a rough number, but you take the number 100 minus your age, and that's how much you should have in equities. So therefore, a young person in their 20s, might have 20% of their money in bonds, 80% into equities. Uh, whereas as you approach retirement, you get into you know your golden years, that number may shift to only 20% in equities, 80% in fixed income. Again, a very rough golden, uh, I'm not golden, a very rough rule, but uh, that's, that's how it works. Now, everything, the financial markets have been just turned and flipped upside down with tr uh, distortions and government intervention unprecedented like we've never we have never seen anything like this in history the quantitative easing and uh, everything they've done zero interest rate environments that's not new but a lot of the other stuff quantitative easing which is bond buying printing money things like that uh, that that is new that has caused a lot of distortions in the market and uh, in my opinion created a uh, a bubble that is almost certain to have a long-term lasting effects. And I don't want to be dramatic. 
I don't, you know, some of you know the site Zero Hedge, and it's a doom and gloom site about investing. I, I never visit the site, but people send me articles. I know of it, and it's always painting a doom and gloom scenario, no matter how good things are or how bad they are at the time. Um, but I do see what could be the perfect storm in investing, and that is the fact that the largest, you know, the bond market and the stock market, which is the majority of where money is invested, you know, uh, individuals, institutional money, um, they are both, the outlook for both is extremely grim. Uh, the stock market, I won't get into in this video. I'm going to try to keep this short. This is actually my second draft. The first one, there's so much information to really cover to try to give an overview of the bond market because it's, it's, it's made up of different subsets. That video I had to scrap. It was going too long. So I'm giving you the condensed version right now the best I can. And um, the uh, point being that the bond market is very important. And uh, the stock market, what I was getting at a minute ago, valuations are extremely high, depending on which measures you look at. They are at the higher end of historic norms. There has been a bubble, especially in dividend paying stocks, um, because of the zero interest rate environment. Those typical safe income investors or income investors um, that d relied on the income, retirees, et cetera, pension plans, they had no choice when bonds, when the government took bonds, took us down to a zero interest rate environment and bonds were paying next to nothing. And in some countries, you even have negative rates now. Um, that forced money into uh, things such as dividend paying stocks, uh, junk bonds, which are questionable fundamentals, uh, bonds from corporations and things like that. And um, it's really pushed valuations up, especially on those dividend paying stocks to many of those to levels unseen uh, ever. Um, so you know, we can argue all day long. Some people tell you the market's very fairly valued based on where rates are, blah, 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 et cetera. But you would just look at P ratios and we can see we're at the high end of the, of the ranges. So that's that on the stock market. Bond market, let's just let's just talk about this. We're going to start out with government bonds, and I'll quickly touch on the other uh, sub subsectors, if you will, or different types of bonds. Uh, this is TLT. I'll get to that in a minute. TLT is the, probably one of the more popular popular uh, bond ETFs. It's a 20 plus year treasury bond. So you have the, the what they call the long bonds, 20 to 30 year bonds in there. But uh, to look at rates, I like to use TYX and TNX are two of the more popular one. These are this these are rates for the 30-year Treasury yield index. So 30-year government bonds. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still coming off a bug, feeling a little better today. Um, let's go all the way back to long term. Let's just take a look at the big picture and then we'll zoom down. This is a 30-year chart of TYX, 30-year bonds, bond yields. And remember, bond yields and bond prices have a direct inverse correlation. When interest rates go up, the price of bonds goes down, especially with treasury bonds more so. They're pure play. You have, uh, there's really the, the risk element is taken out. Junk bonds, a whole different story. You have uh, default risk as well. It, and actually more, they trade more to the default risk, more to the stock market or the business cycle than they do to interest rates, believe it or not. Um, but this is, Sorry, I had a little pop-up notification I had to dismiss and take care of. Uh, computer was threatening to restart. Uh, where was I? Okay, this is the 30-year uh, Treasury Yield Index. And as you can see, going back 30 years, interest rates peaked back in 1981. That's when you had double-digit rates. Um, if you took a mortgage out back then, or if you bought a treasury bond, a long bond, a CD, you know, going out more than a few years, you were getting double digit returns on your money. It was great. I remember as a rookie broker, you know, some of the clients coming in, I started at Merrill Lynch and you'd have clients come in with these you know, 15, even 18% CDs and treasuries uh, that were coming due. It was like, wow. I'm in, even back then, you know, rates were seven, eight percent on on CDs and things only going out a few years. So it was impressive to see that. Um, sure, I was alive back then, but uh, you know, my, I wasn't much of a saver or investor back then. Um, anyways, that's that's what rates have done. So you can see a clear downtrend in interest rates or what we call a secular bear market in interest rates. Um, there was actually a, a, this these yellow lines to find an, a descending price channel, which rates were moving down in pretty consistently. It was bounding the uh, upper and lower ends. Then you had the financial crisis, 2008. That changed things 
there was a flight to safety in treasury bonds, which, which, you know, when you buy bonds, price goes up, so the yield goes down. Just remember, everything's backwards when we talk about price and yields. We're looking at yields now. So during the meltdown in 08, you had a very, you know, sharp spike down. But as soon as the risk abated, there was, you know, prices snapped back right up within that range and behaved well. Then came quantitative easing, which was, like I said, un unprecedented. We'd never seen anything like it. And we popped, you know, due to, to the manipulation in the bond markets, uh, money printing, bond buying. That's a lot of what the Fed did is buying uh, just tremendous amounts of bonds, inflating their balance sheet and uh, trying to manipulate rates down. So you have a couple times where we fell out of the channel. And that's that. But the bottom line is, I'm, it, to an extent, I'm a purist. You know, I understand they took prices below the channel. That happens. Um, but as far as technicals go, I'm a purist. I can say that the same technical patterns that work on this this 30-year monthly chart, meaning every candlestick a monthly, one-month price action, works just as well down on the weekly, daily, even intraday time frames, whether it's a trend line, a support resistance level, divergences that, that foreshadow or... or you know, warn of a impending trend change. And that's what we have here, strong bullish divergence. So if you take the this trend line at the lows, prices making lower lows versus the RSI and the PPO, which is a much, does a much better job out on a monthly time frame than the, its cousin, the MACD, you see bullish divergence or a bullish falling wedge. You could probably even draw, you know, you could draw a couple trend lines. This is certainly one to watch. But the most important thing, and it take a little while to get there, is a break above this channel. My point here is that we are at a bottom. Interest rates have nowhere to go but down. Uh, yes, uh, you know, theory, zero is not theoretically the bottom. As we know, some other countries have already taken rates. Some of the European nations have gone below zero. But you, there's only so much you can you can push that, uh, that on that uh, level down below zero. You can go a quarter point here, half you know half a percent. You go much more than that, and I've read about this, and I know it to be true. If a country tries to go or government tries to go to let's say negative three percent interest rates, nobody's going to put their money in the bank. That money's going to go out. It's going to find its way into gold. It'll go under a mattress in a safe deposit box. Nobody's going to stick a hundred thousand dollars in a bank with a promise that a year from now you're going to get back ninety-seven thousand, or in other words, negative three percent interest. That's what negative rates are. That's why zero, give or take, within mere basis points, is theoretically it is the it's the floor. Uh, for interest rates. And we're at that floor. We just hit that floor. So my point being, can we trade here for a while? Absolutely. We can trade here for years at, at, at a flat interest rates, low interest rates, or as a lot of what I'm reading and what I know to be true, there's been a tremendous issuance of, of bonds well beyond what we've ever seen in recent years with this zero interest rate environment. You have companies like Apple, cash rich tech companies that would that historically never borrowed money, didn't issue bonds because they didn't need to. They Their biggest problem was what to do with all their cash. And yet, when you have free money, why not? And that's what Apple did a couple of years ago. They said, why not? We'll sell bonds. We have a great credit rating. We'll borrow money at next to nothing, turn around and buy back our stock and try to boost our share price because we ran out of ideas. What's Apple done since you know Jobs passed away? Nothing. You know, they were great. They came out with the iPad, then the iPhone. Uh, or uh, what iPod, iPad, iPhone, Max, but th th there, there, there's nothing new now. And Apple peaked back in March twenty, April twenty eighth of two thousand fifteen. I remember it clearly. Posting that day, a very bearish development. They gapped up on a big earnings report to all time highs. That was it. Stock has never seen those highs again, and may never. And that was with a massive share buyback program that they took advantage of with these low rates. So my point is. The companies that didn't even need to borrow money borrowed money because it was so cheap and now and then you read about the you know the potential for a you know a, a mass exit out of these these bonds especially given any hot inflation numbers but uh one more thing i'll, I'll, I'll mention here is uh you know the fed doesn't control uh, interest rates. A lot of people, they don't have direct control over interest rates, I should say. Now, you're probably saying, Randy, that's ridiculous. That's all they do. We, we sit here every every month or every other month and we hang on their words. The Fed controls two rates, the discount window and the federal funds rate. Those are rates at which the banks can borrow money from each other to you know, shore up, you know, whatever they're, they're, they need to keep on their reserve requirements. And if they're in really hot water, they go to the Fed's discount window, borrow directly from the Fed. That's it. 
Feds control short-term rates. Treasury bonds, even though they're government bonds, the rates are not set by the Treasury. They are set at auction. New issues come out, they go to auction, and it is simply supply and demand. So the Fed can't come out with a 30-year bond saying, okay, we're, we want to offer uh, 2% on this 30-year Treasury bond right now. Uh, take it or leave it. 2% is a rate. doesn't work that way. They put those bonds at, at auction, and if there's a lot of demand for them, everyone's going to buy them, and uh, the rates are going to go lower than 2%. If there's very little demand, and uh, you get less interest than they expected, and they, they were coming to price those out at a coupon of 2%, the, the yield's going to be higher than that. Uh, because there's not enough demand and they have to offer a higher yield or the bond price has to drop to to effectively pay out a higher yield. Uh, so I want you to know that happens across the board, even on a, down on a one-year treasury note. The Fed does not set the rates, the market does, supply and demand. So what can happen? The Fed can keep the, their foot pinned on the pedal as long as they want and that'll keep short-term rates low. And for you guys that are familiar with what a yield curve is, you know, you take, and this is going to be a very crude drawing here, but you take a box like this, draw it out, and on this axis you have um, time, and here you have interest rates. So the higher higher the rates and the longer the time, and this is what a, a yield curve looks like. So what can happen? We can have the yield curve really steep in here. The Fed can keep short-term rates low. Low rates, oh, wrong, wrong drawing tool there. Let's try this one. The Fed can keep rates low but the market can push them up and you can have any any shape yield curve typically an inverted yield curve uh, warns of a recession coming up but everything the yield curve has been so distorted with all the manipulation in the markets but I just wanted to mention that Fed controls this the very short-term rates they don't control this this is supply and demand so that tremendous bubble that's formed in bonds with a lot of people going into bonds and the fact that interest rates theoretically or at a bottom, have hit a bottom and can go no lower, says this can only go up over time. It can certainly trade sideways for a while, but over time, rates are going to go up and the charts are powerful. And when you start seeing these levels, all of these lines are levels, technical levels. When they start getting taken out, at some point, we will recognize that this secular downtrend or bear market in interest rates is over and the markets have now embarked on a new secular bull market and rates. Uh, don't know when that's going to come. It may come gradually. It may come after years of low rates. Or remember, these are the long bonds. This this could start going up. So something to watch for. And again, the importance here, it, mainly to long-term investors. And please keep in mind that uh, even if you don't give two flips about a bond or bond fund, you don't care to own it, the financial markets are very interrelated. You know, if you start seeing a uh, interest rates ticking up, especially in long bonds, that is where the bulk of pension plans, uh, you're talking major, huge state pension plans, government pension plans, uh, corporate pension plans, people have money in their 401ks, rising rates means falling bond prices. It's as simple as that. That correlation is direct, especially in risk-free bonds like this and treasury bonds. And so what happens is, as I said, the bond market is larger than the stock market. That gets ugly. Those pension plans that have certain projections that they have to meet, uh, growth projections and all that, well, what are they going to do? At most points in time, see, the thing is, when the stock market gets frothy, uh, stock markets had a, a run up. We're right now over seven years into one of the longest and most powerful bull markets in history. Statistically, this thing is very long in the tooth. And the one certainty with the financial markets is we have bull markets and bear markets. We have economic expansions and contractions. And normally when you get the stock market gets frothy um, and it's due for a correction, stock market starts going down, then the bond market does good at that point in time. People will then start selling their stocks and they can move into bonds and the bond prices go up as uh, interest rates go down. That, that's not an option right now. As I just made the point, bonds virtually have, at best case, prices stay where they are. And at, w at worst case, which is the most likely scenario, bond prices are going to go down. And with stock market being seven years into, you know, plus into a, a bull market and with extreme valuations, the future outlook for stock prices isn't good. So this is a perfect storm here, guys. Um, 
and that's what I know people have been harping on forever, the gold trade. And, um, you know, we'll see, that's certainly one place. There's always places to put your money and there's always companies that make money. Like I said, you know, marijuana stocks, we'll get into those later. That's one area of growth in, in the upcoming year. So we'll find out ways to make money other than shorting stocks. But I just wanted to point that out. All right. Uh, I'm tr looking down at the clock, trying to see how I'm tracking here. So I'm going to move faster. Uh, I think I've impressed the point here that there is a potential bubble. And, and really what, what prompted me to do this video is yesterday's price action. We saw a huge move. This is just a, uh, a weekly chart, a 10-year weekly chart of TYX, the government, um, the 30-year bond yields. Look at these divergent low. These are the things you guys know I like to look for. I look for divergences to confirm a pending trend change. You can, especially when lined up with a bearish rising or falling wedge, um, or a well-defined downtrend line, which we had here. So there was a breakdown, a breakout above a downtrend line slash bearish rising, uh, bearish, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, talking all over myself here, bullish falling wedge. Um, prices were in a bearish trend, but that's a bullish falling wedge pattern. It was confirmed with bullish divergence. And it broke out and played out as expected. And we've come full circle to now an even much larger bearish falling wedge. There's bullish divergence or positive divergence there confirming the wedge. And yesterday we broke out. We had a huge day, one of the biggest days in bonds in a long time. So unless this is reversed soon, you know, I always say trading a weekly chart, wait for a weekly close. A week isn't over yet. We still have another trading day after today. But so far that looks pretty legit, like the real deal. And that would portend higher um, bond yields, i.e. lower bond prices, I'd say. You know, next target on this one, well, I, I haven't mocked the chart up, and I don't want to do that now. It'll take too much time, but certainly could see a move up here, and that's a that's a pretty good move for treasuries, and then ultimately there's, there's a lot more upside. So let's just look at the daily chart, see what happened there. You can see TYX gapped above this. There was a pretty solid resistance level. You can see that line I have there. Numerous reactions to the left that define this level, and... Um, we gapped above and there's the next target. So I, I do see resistance overhead and we'll flip this guy around. You guys are probably familiar with TLT. TLT is the long bond ETF, holds 20 to 30 year bonds. So that's just really an upside down chart because this is the ETF. So it shows the bond prices and uh, busy chart. Forgive me, I haven't had time to clean it up, but there was an uptrend line I was watching. We broke down, back tested, rolled over. And yesterday's price action, like I said, this was just a ginormous move down, relatively speaking. That's a horrible drawing tool there, but uh, you can see what I'm trying to get at, just trying to highlight that big move down yesterday in, in Treasury bond prices. Um, and it just doesn't fit with what happened in the stock market. Yeah, stock market was up and that could lead to a sell-off in bonds because risk on, risk off. In other words, risk off of stocks rally. Uh, they're not worried about things. So the risk off trade is stocks up, bonds down, but not this, not this much. I don't know. I have my suspicions. Maybe that was, you know, I'm sure there were uh, quite a few. The Trump win was unexpected. It wasn't, he wasn't favored going into the election. So therefore you may have, this could have been partly uh, some foreign governments that, that don't care for Trump. There's not the old, old political regime that was expected to be in place. Um, now, so maybe they dumped, you know, there's a lot of countries out there with massive amounts of U.S. Treasury holdings. Either way, whatever the cause of this, it was technically a very bearish event. There was this other trend line I've been watching for a while back here. Um, you know, I created this one a while ago. And this, this trend line, we gap below it as well as this horizontal price support on TLT. You can see all the reactions here, some back here. And we were down to that level now. So we're at support now. Uh, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't short TLT at this point. In fact, if you have asked, I'd say probably get a bounce. But I don't see anything down here. When I study the charts, this all looks bearish. We don't have any divergence. Sure, oversold. It's been oversold for a while, but that's daily time frame. You go back out to the weekly time frame, we're not even yet down to oversold levels. We were oversold back here, and that was a good time to go long TLT. We were oversold here. That was a good time to go long TLT. But uh, we never made it down to oversold here, just like we haven't here yet. See, we're above oversold. And although we came close, 
and got a little bounce there. The bottom didn't come to well after. In fact, you had to we had to put in positive divergence. See that took a divergent low. So this is these are the two times I see meaningful reversals, either a tag of a tag of oversold or a near tag or even a tag followed by another higher low and i.e. bullish divergence and uh, that's not what we see here. Okay, I'm not tracking much better in the last video, but I will wrap it up quick, run through these. The other type of bonds that we need to watch are municipals. This is a, I, f I like this one because it is, it's widely traded, very liquid. The iShares S&P National Municipal Bond ETF, municipal bonds, for those of you not familiar, are issued by local and state municipalities, city, state governments, things like that, for various purposes, and they're various types with various credit quality. But for the most part, they're considered safe. A lot of those are insured. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if everyone in here are insured bonds. Um, as you guys know, sometimes states and, and local governments do declare bankruptcy. Uh, there have been they have been known to default on those bonds, and some, like I said, are insured. Some aren't. Um, that's actually something we ought to take a look at. Are the bond insurers? Uh, that's let me make a note right here now to look at those because those if this continues to happen. We may want to look at a short on the companies that insure municipal bonds. I've done that in the past and made some good money. All right, MUB. Uh, there it is. You had an uptrend line break and a violent sell-off since then. This is a drop, you know, from the highs. I had this crazy candlestick here. But this, the muni bonds have dropped almost 5% in, if you look to the left, four months. They're paying out. They're yielding now. And that yield would have been lower up there when prices were higher. As at this point, they're yielding 2.37%. And again, it would have probably been 2% or so up here. So what that means is you wiped out in four months the amount of money, the amount of interest that you would have expected to collect it had you bought up here. Had you been unfortunate enough to buy these highs? And I may, I put up a post a few months back warning about uh, a correction, a significant top in the municipal bond market. Um, you, in four months, have lost twice of what you would be lucky to what you would make roughly in interest payments or dividends holding this thing for a whole year so if this continues and this is the point you're wiping out a tremendous amount of wealth these people go into most people go into bond funds especially muni bonds for safety and here's that long-term chart i put up and again you can just go to the symbol tag thing on the front page i can't remember the name of the post there's a ticker by symbol you drop down box type in mub it'll pull this up it was up here it was a little early but i point out this rising wedge we overshot the wedge by hair see that little candlestick pop through but a beautiful clean well-defined well-defined means a lot of touches on the bottom of this this uh lower uptrend line on the bearish rising wedge pattern a very large bearish rising wedge pattern confirmed with negative divergence and it's only just now starting to break down and play out uh, these are targets Ultimately, I've been maintaining this longer-term downside target in MUB for, for a long time. I don't expect us to get there overnight, but you need to understand the gravity. The municipal bond market's huge, just as the Treasury and corporate bond markets are huge. And, um, you know, you're talking a potential drop, and I'm not even, I didn't even grab the highs. If we get down there, 15% drop on something that's paying you just, you know, 2 and 2.3, 2.4%. Um, so uh, there's just a lot of uh, like a, as with the stock market virtually or more so i could say clearly in, in fixed income virtually no upside potential anymore other than if you're lucky and rates stay down here they keep the fed keeps the met, uh, pedal pin to the floor then we keep rates near zero and you collect a measly two point something percent so you talk about an ugly risk return i always put all my trades in, into the perspective of risk versus return you're risking you know 5 10 15 possibly 15 percent downside depending on how long you hold to make two, two, a little over 2%, it's just, it's ludicrous to me. This is a bubble. And more importantly, the articles that I read now with all these mutual funds holding bonds, money crammed into there, you can see a rush for the exits. And as investors go to withdraw from these funds when they start going down, and this is where I'm talking about, the Fed can be powerless when it comes to this. If these mutual funds, which hold trillions in bonds, 
uh, as well as individual bonds, if they all start getting sold at once, and they talk about this, there's sort of a vacuum of liquidity. There's a lot less liquidity in the bond market than there used to be. And I can, I can cite this through uh, you know, journal, uh, Wall Street Journal articles and other sources. Um, you can see a very, very powerful drop in, in bond prices. And that can wipe out years and years of gains in just months. Um, you know, we've already wiped out, you know, couple looks probably at least a couple of years of dividends and um, the downsides potential uh, the potential for the downside is huge is what I'm trying to say and it looks like we're just getting going here and there's some weird things that happened yesterday you can even see the muni market down huge in the last two days uh, something's going on in the fixed income market and this should be a red flag all right move down the line we're almost done here LQD corporate bonds I went over the treasuries which are considered the the most secure the government the, the the general consensus is the government will never default on their bonds. And even though our our government, you know, as many on you know, paper, you know, if we were an individual or corporation, a bank wouldn't lend a penny to you and have debt to the debt to income that they have, you know, debt to their GDP ratio is crazy. It's just ballooning. But here's a good thing. If you're the government, print money and that's what they've been doing and that's how they're paying down debt so theoretically you're not going to lose however corporations can't do that um, so you have this is a corporate bond ETF this one's been falling off a cliff lately down just in the last few months it's dropped almost five percent and it's paying a measly dividend of about 3.31 and you can see this flight to save or flight out of bonds has already begun uh, there is some support right around here I could probably put that line down that previous reaction low is where it should be I haven't modified this chart in a while here's a reaction high so there's some support down below and uh, you know some pretty decent support down here so this is where I'd really I wouldn't I wouldn't try to care to game any of these bounces I wouldn't be surprised to see little reactions there you know, you had a divergent high, by the way, back here that shows that. So uh, there's more downside. And that's just a daily chart. The bigger picture is when you go out to the weekly charts. Let's say rates get back to where they were back in 2007, 2008, which, by the way, they were already already artificially low. The whole reason we're here is the Fed kept the pedal down on the gas too long. They created a housing bubble by keeping rates artificially too low for too long. Uh, leading up to the financial crisis. So at this point, rates were lower than where they should have been by, you know, just about everything that I believe to be true and a lot of things that I've read. Let's just say we go back, rates go back to that level. There's a drop of 10, over 10% 10 in corporate bonds. Uh, and I could easily see that happening over the next year. So, uh, you know, you make 3%, a little better than 3% in dividends and you lose 10% in principal, you're going backwards by 7%. And uh, you're, you're wiping out a lot of wealth. That's the bottom line. And that can carry over into the stock market because unlike other points in time, uh, the stock market is far from cheap or undervalued right now. So where do you put your money? Um, yes, you know, plays into the hand of those people calling for gold to the moon. Um, but again, well, I, I trade gold based on the charts, not any. You know, we've had people calling for gold to the moon since before the financial crisis hit and, and every day thereafter. Um, LQD. All right, the other two are junk bonds, and we're, we're, we're done here. All right, so we went through the gamut so far, the spectrum. We had uh, treasury bonds, which are your most secure. We had municipal bonds, municipal bonds very, mostly is secure probably right there next to treasuries as far as security corporate bonds investment grade that was corporate bonds were the lqd investment grade that's triple a rated down to double b rated anything below i'm sorry triple a to triple b anything below triple b meaning double b or below are junk bonds and that's what we're looking at here uh doesn't mean the bonds are throw them in the trash or worthless nope just a nickname given to those these are companies that have you know fundamental issues uh, low credit ratings and their default risk is substantially higher than investment grade bonds um, and th these actually trade much more in line with the stock market than they do with interest rates as do all other the other bonds that we talked about and the reason being is when the economy is doing well when the economy is expanding uh, during an expansion, you see default rates very low. However, when the economy begins to contract, especially during a recession, then you see a surge in, in defaults, meaning they stop paying the interest payments 
or, and or they may not pay back some or even all of the principles well. And that's when, as you can see here in 2008, you can see the junk bonds melted down like the stock market. They dropped almost as much. They were down, I'm just eyeballing this, about 45%. And that's, you know, stock market, depending on which, actually, I didn't even get the highs. The highs were over here. So yeah, just like the market, they dropped about 50% or so. Uh, and just like the stock market, when the economy started coming back and the and stock market rallied, they came back. So <clears throat> now what happened yesterday? Well, the market was up across the board, yet I noticed that junk bonds were down. So like I said, a lot of weird things going on here. The bond market is flashing some some scary signals to me right now. Uh, you can see zooming in here. There's yesterday and today again, we're down while the stock market for the most part was up earlier. I'm looking as I do this video, the SPY is barely green, 0.07%. Uh, the Qs have gone red. I pointed that out yesterday, guys, with the biotechs. And it was biotechs. And although I didn't go into a separate video, the financials really buoyed everything. And, and, and we're holding up the SPY today. But uh, the big red flag besides the bond market, and i got to cut this video off. It's gone on long enough, is the fact those leading tech companies that have led this market up throughout the bull market. Uh, Apple and, and Google or Alphabet, uh, all those big names, they are even yesterday we're down. There's some ugly things going on under the hood here. The bond market's flashing all kinds of warning signs. Uh, stock market was up yesterday, so you would have expected junk bonds to be up, and they weren't. Here's a long-term trend line that goes back to the 2014 highs. You can see it here. We're back testing that, as well as um, this is my first down downside target, which has been hit now. It's a pretty key support level. We'll go back to the daily chart. Watch this level. It's intersecting support, downtrend line, and horizontal price support. You can see how well defined uh, some levels there. And then if it drops there, this would be my next target. You can see the support levels there, and then another target down here. Uh, this is this is an indicator of economic health. If uh, the either the actual or perceived risk of defaults within these companies in the junk bond arena start going up. Um, then that's a red flag for the stock market. It shows that uh, the economy may be rolling over here. All right, um, HYG, if you want to look, a lot of people also trade HYG in lieu of uh, JNK, HYG. There's HYG, that hit my first target. You can see the negative divergence, everything it was priced in. So we, you know, we had a divergent low here, was bullish, see the neg positive divergence, uh, very well-defined downtrend line. We broke out and it played out as it should have. However, we had these series of divergence, a bearish rising wedge pattern, negative divergence, um, breakdown, pushed back up to former support, now resistance, fell back down, hit my first target. We're having a little reaction there. And if and when that T1 level goes, which I suspect it probably will, that takes us down to T2, then T3 after maybe a minor reaction there, T2, a little bounce and then move down, something like that. Um, and that's it. So those are the things I'm watching, guys, among other things. Like I'm watching the internals. I don't care about the advanced decline ratio so much right now is, is, is so much as the leading stocks breaking down. And again, I'll be watching the bond market closely for any signs of uh, cracks, because as I said, uh, whether or not you trade bonds, uh, it can, it can, uh, any crisis in the bond market can most certainly spill over into both the stock market as well as the economy. Uh, so something to watch for. All right, this has been Randy Finney with Right Side of the Chart, and I do apologize for how long this video went. I just wanted to get all that in uh, since I think it's important both uh, near term as well as, as for anybody's long-term investment strategy. Uh, have a great day.